Uh, Vice President Nangolo Mbumba has been inaugurated as president along with the new vice president, that's Netumbo Nadi Dwaike. The pair will serve under presidential and national assembly elections towards the end of the year. For more on this uh, discussion, we are, are now joined by Rui Chikende, who is a politics lecturer at the University of Namibia. He joins us from the capital, Windhoek, to look at what the future holds for the nation under a new president. A pleasure to have you on the program. Uh, so with Nangolo Mbumba sworn in as uh, Namibia's president uh, following the passing of Hage Gengob, how do you anticipate this transition of power will influence the country's political landscape, especially leading to the scheduled elections in November this year? Well, our constitutional framework is quite clear in terms of the, in terms of the matrix of succession. Article 34 clearly paths the way in terms of who should be the successor. Uh, Nangolo Mbumba, for your information, is 82 years old. Uh, President Gainkop was 82 years old as well. So in terms of the political landscape and uh, the possibility of him wanting to exceed his term of office, um, I don't think he will have any ambitions to go beyond uh, this constitutional mandate. Uh, but in terms of the politics of the party, there have been speculation that others would want to throw in their hat to succeed mm. uh, Nangolo Mbupa. But he has made it categorically clear, more specifically in the recent political bureau meeting, that he has no ambitions whatsoever to go beyond the unexpired term of the late President Gainbo. So you do describe that you don't expect any significant change regarding uh, the mandate for this uh, new president. But as Namibia experiences a change in leadership, what challenges or opportunities do you think lie ahead for this nation? Uh, in terms of the succession matrix, uh, the challenges are quite obvious. Mm -hmm. It is the socio-economic conditions that have been uh, engulfing the country since independence in 1990. And also the fact that we have been experiencing a drought for the past 13 years. The COVID-19 pandemic that has created havoc, especially for the most vulnerable in society. But more importantly is the fact that our country has been experiencing a litany of other problems, not only at the political level, but also at the social level. Out of a population of 2.4 million, we have 1 million people that are unsure of how they are able to grapple with the constitutional mandate that housing should be provided for the ordinary person. Unemployment, especially amongst the youth, is currently at 34 percent. We also have an issue of inequality. We are the most unequal society after South Africa in the world. Mm -hmm. So those are key issues that the electorate will be asking themselves of how they want to live in a society that is unable to cater for the material conditions of his people. Of course, politicians tend to make promises to people, and uh, people always ask themselves, in this space of inequality, in this space of unemployment, in this space of hunger, how can we create some sort of uh, leverage with the political elite for them to hear our cries of where we have come? Where we have come. But, uh, it is also critical in these trying times to understand the dynamics of what has transpired in our country. Uh, it's not usual to mm -hmm. say that uh, a country like ours has ever witnessed the death of a president while in office. So it's actually trying times for our society, but I'm quite optimistic for how things have transpired thus far that will be able to overcome the challenges, more specifically in the arena of the challenges that we face in terms of the legal obstacles. So when looking at the late uh, Hage Gengnob's uh, um, legacy, a lot's been said, and in recent times, even following news of his death, a lot was said also about the support uh, that he offered uh, South Africa in its case in the ICJ against uh, Israel's uh, uh, actions in Gaza. Maybe let's speak more about the legacy of the late statesman. 
Look, uh, any president, whether it's the president of the United States, the president of an African country, will definitely have a mixed legacy because uh, these tend to be quite subjective. But in our case, uh, President Gankov has a definite mixed legacy. Mm. When he ascended to the corridors of power in 2013, he made a litany of promises of how he wanted to transform society. At the economic level or at the social level, he promised to eradicate poverty. He wanted to bring prosperity to all members of Namibian society. But we need to compare policy intent with policy impact. What has, what has exactly happened in his term of office? What's important to note that in 2016, he doubled the old pension grant for senior citizens from 600 rand to 1,200 rand. Mm. So in terms of the politics of welfare, the pensioners benefited tremendously from his term of office. In the sense that they could actually have more disposable income to cater for their various expenses. And as I always say, uh, Young people, especially people like us, we tend to dump our young ones with our elderly, whether it's at villages or various urban centers. So that kind of disposable income had a significant impact of how our elderly were able to cope with the difficult economic circumstances, especially in the background of drought, the footprint or the difficult fiscal space that Namibia was in, and also the COVID-19 pandemic that created havoc and uprooted the livelihood of ordinary Namibians. So for the ordinary folk, especially for the, cities, for the elderly citizens, they were actually uh, happy and they appreciated the fact that we had a president who was able to give them some sort of leeway or some sort of fiscal space to operate within. But again, uh, looking at the facts, mm -hmm. Out of 2.4 million people, you have 1.6 million people living in poverty, and you look at his signature development program, which was Duke the Harambe Prosperity Plan. It was unable to significantly address the material conditions of the majority of the Namibian populace. So there are a number of people that feel like this guy actually made promises, but look where we are now. Yeah. Are we better off? since he has departed the face of earth and a majority of them would say no so given this uh, mixed legacy and also some of the socio-economic problems that you highlighted uh, in namibia do you believe that this uh, transitional uh, leadership or administration will indeed fast track uh, its stance in how it addresses some of these problems i don't think so if you look at the statements that have been made by the acting president, uh, His Excellency in Angola Mbumba, mm. he made it very clear that he would want to continue with where the previous head of state uh, left. So in terms of policy innovation, in terms of new ideas, in terms of new programs or policies, the status quo will prevail. Remember, he has, not, he has less than one year left to execute the mandate of the previous president. So there's not much room left for him to really come up with radical changes or with radical proposals. He even inherited the political rhetoric that the previous president had, a legacy of a one Namibian house where no one should feel left out. All well, at the political level, at the philosophical level, that sounds good. No one should feel left out in the Namibian house. Mm -hmm. But a house has various categories. It has a bedroom, it has a living area, it has a garage, it has a quarters. A majority of the Namibian populace actually find themselves exposed to the vulnerabilities of the natural environment. They don't feel part and parcel of the court stock of the Namibian house. So if the acting president has had any ideas of really transforming the current political landscape. He has little room left to maneuver around that. And Rui, as we wrap up, and also leading to these uh, much-anticipated elections in November, uh, later on this year, uh, what do you anticipate, especially when it comes to the level of contestation between uh, the varying political parties in Namibia? 
Swapo, in its current uh, iteration, it's a political entity that is wounded. Uh, it is wounded in the context that it has been unable to significantly transform the material conditions of the Namibian populace. If you look at the election results of uh, 2019, and you compare that to the election results of 2014, you are looking at a political entity that has been unable to transform or to transcend beyond the rhetoric of the liberation mantra. The reason why I'm saying is that in 2014, the late President Gainko garnered 87% of the presidential vote. Fast forward to 2019, he garnered 56% of the vote. So that's like an A student becoming a D student. Why is that the case? It is because of the fish rod saga. It was a fish, a fishing quota scandal that engulfed the ruling party mm. because there were allegations that the president was directly involved in this uh, corruption scandal, that his senior ministers, more specifically the attorney general and the minister of fisheries and marine resources, benefited personally from this fish rod saga and it also helped the president to propel him to win the election in 2017. So this public perception did not only lead to the resignation of these two senior figures in government, it also led to the ruling party being severely wounded. Beyond that, more importantly, is the fact that a number of Namibians lost their jobs in the fishing industry because fishing quotas were taken from companies that were actually producing jobs and were given to cronies of the ruling party and those senior ministerial figures that resigned. Rui, let me thank you for your time as we extend our gratitude to our esteemed guest, that's Rui Kitende, for sharing his valuable insights into the recent political developments uh, this time in Namibia. He